you. We thank you for your heart and for who you are and for the ability that we have to come before you. God, we just, we silence ourselves today. God, praise be to you, God, the anchor for my soul. God, thank you. Amen. You can all be seated. Uh, again, like I said before, I have the honor of being able to invite one of my friends here today. Uh, Shar has worked for the uh, Assemblies of God District here in Northern California and Nevada for many years in many different ways. It's over 20 years now, isn't it? 23 years. Um, when she walks up here, you will not even be able to fathom that. Um, she is just as is an incredible person, has been able to do so many different things within the district. Um, but I highly respect her because I've seen what it looks like for her uh, to fight through different seasons of her life and what this looks like. Uh, and, and she has been placed into positions um, that a lot of women just haven't been able to have opportunities in. So uh, I'm so excited that you are going to join us here today. Um, please come join us. Thank you, friend. Well, hello, hello, hello. How are you today? Great, wonderful to all of you out there in some land, somewhere. <laughs> Get it? Okay, sorry, I'll stop. Anyways, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much, Chris Lynn and Melanie, and uh, to Chancellor um, No for the dream that he had. Every time I pull up here and I look, I, this started with a dream that became a reality. And so I'm grateful for uh, this college. I'm actually enrolled. I'm working toward my master's in, uh, what is it, church, Christian leadership? I'm going to say church leadership, Christian leadership. And um, I'm all in. So I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak. But um, I'm honored to be here. What a wonderful culture that has been created here for uh, learning. And um, I wanted to just share with you today, I don't, I don't always like to call myself a communicator, although that's what I do. I, I, today I want to transfer something to you. When we communicate, sometimes people can just communicate and it's all about your head. But today I want to be able to transfer something to you. And my hope is that by the time I leave today, I will have transferred the power of freedom in, in, in our lives, the power of freedom. And so, Father God, I just pray that your uh, anointing, again, would be on your word today, Lord, that uh, whatever we do and say would bring you glory and would bring you honor, that I would step out of the way, that I would secretly leave the room, and that, Father God, your spirit uh, would, would say today what our hearts need to hear. In your name, Jesus, amen. So I wanted to talk to you about how Jesus changed my life uh, by dragging me by the hair into obedience, kicking and screaming. Um, I'm a strong-willed child. So there's nothing up here that says, rah, 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 I, I, just, love, I just love to obey, right? Because God's love language is obedience. Isn't that the truth? Now, mine is gifts. <laughs> My love language is gifts. Just a heads up on that. My life scripture is... Uh, is Philippians 2.13, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And I remember the first time I read that scripture, I thought I'd hit the lottery. For God is giving you the desire and the power, not just the desire, but also the power. No way. Look at what he's doing. He's doing this for us. Like he's doing all the work. So I would hear these messages about Jesus has done everything on the cross. You don't have to do anything. So it was almost kind of like, hey, I could just kind of kick my feet up and ride. Thank you, Jesus. I'm getting into heaven. I just have to go down to the altar and ask him to forgive me my sins. And I'm in, good, you know, I'm good, I'm good to go. But then all of a sudden, a little bit later in James, I read, faith without works is dead. You know, isn't that interesting? How that it's, the, the word of God is the, is, the com, is the culmination. You can't just read one thing out of context. You have to take it all in together, right? It was like, as a kid, I remember I would go to the altar. <laughs> I would go to the altar one Sunday. Because if you were raised in church, you went to the altar multiple times for the same sin, Am I right? Is this not true? And you got saved like a million times, right? With each new evangelist, you were like, I need to give my heart to Jesus. You know, you, you know across the nation that you have been counted 50 million times, right, in salvation records somewhere. And so I would go to the altar one week, and they would be like, are you surrendered to the Lord? I'm surrendering. And then the next week I'd go, and they'd be like, are you contending for the faith? I'd be like, I'm contending. Are you surrendered? I'm surrendered. Are you contending? I'm contending. And then one day in prayer, he's like, Lord, do I surrender or contend? And he's like, yes, 
But anyways, we have a hard time with either or, both and, it's to be both and. So faith without works is dead, but he also gives me the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And I had a lot of faith, but I really didn't have a lot of works. Whoa. I remember one time my friend and I were at the altar, and we listened. My friend said to me, she goes, did you just hear that lady next to us? And I said, no. And I looked up, and there was a lady, and she was at the altar, and she was, um, she was a rather, what would we say now that would be appropriate? Maybe the word would be big boned. Uh, you know, she was, you know. She was, she was thick. Can I, say, can I say that? Is that okay? Can I say thick? She was thick. And I'll never forget, her prayer at the altar was, Lord, reduce me so I may dance before you. And my friend were like, no way. That's, you can pray to lose weight? So like that night, I used to be a lot bigger than I am now. That night in bed, I remember I was like, Lord, maybe this works. Maybe I'll wake up skinny. Lord, reduce me so I can dance before you, right? And so I realized that God just doesn't do that to us. God doesn't all of a sudden, you wake up and you didn't study for the test and all of a sudden you have revelatory knowledge about the scripture that you didn't, the, the chapter that you didn't read. Isn't that true? Or all of a sudden you wake up and you have muscles that you've never used because, well, the Lord, he just blessed me with all these muscles. I didn't even go to the gym. Or all of a sudden you wake up and you're thin. You're like, look at that. I could sell, I'm gonna sell this on eBay, Right? like Oprah, and you get a school, and you get it, I'll, I'll stop. You don't get to delegate discipline because it's an inside job. Discipline, today I want to talk about, equals freedom. And man, I ran from discipline. Richard Foster says, the desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. I love that. See, I was the baby of the family. Discipline was something that happened to my sister, not me, right? Even when my dad would get upset with me and I, it was my turn to get a spank and my mom would go up to him and she would say, oh, honey, don't spank her today. She doesn't feel well. Until one day when my dad went to go and spank me. This was, I was raised in the 80s back when you spanked kids. Yeah, we turned out way better than y'all. I'm just saying. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> uh, and I remember one day my dad, he, I, I went to, he went to, to discipline me, and I go, oh, daddy, daddy, don't. I don't feel well. And my mom's like, spanker, right? <laughs> but the Bible says that God disciplines those he loves, but I got to tell you the truth. I would rather discipline myself than be disciplined by God. So if I'm effective at disciplining myself, uh, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep control of my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be, cast, should be a castaway. All throughout my lifetime, I've witnessed ministers who preach one thing and do another. Those who seem to preach the hardest against sexual immorality have been guilty of the same sin they've preached against. I've realized that we're all the same distance from the ditch, but I don't want you to preach to me while you're in the ditch playing in the mud, right? And so I have several disciplines that I do on a daily basis. I don't share this with you so that you think I'm so great. I share this with you to share with you the glory of God because somebody, I'll never forget years ago, somebody was like, tell me your dreams. And I remember I secretly wanted to say to take a nap. They were like, tell us your dreams. I, I was in a class or something or at a workshop. I'm always at a workshop. They're like, share with us your dreams. And I'm like sitting on the couch eating what I want all day and taking a nap after and then waking up and eating some more and then watching a good program and taking another nap, right? Okay, if I was completely honest. So this is what I have to do on a daily basis so that I don't end up taking a nap and eating on the couch all day. I have 30 minutes of quiet time and scripture meditation with Jesus daily. I write daily. I fasted flour and sugar for the past eight years because I have an addiction and I blow up like a puffer fish when I put flour and sugar in my body. I practice daily confession. I have a sponsor who reads over my gratitude list and what I'm going to eat every single day the following day. Those are just daily things and habits and disciplines at 46 years old. I know you're thinking, wow, she's 46. No, at 46 years old, those are the daily things I have to do on a regular basis so that I can become on an outward, outwardly, so that I can do anything inwardly for the kingdom of God. So I want to look today specifically at honest confession, the discipline of honest confession. And I, I, I say it this way, I say, I Tom. You're like, sure, that's weird. What's, why, who's Tom and why are you using his name? I Tom, I tell on myself. 
I Tom. Accountability is offering up information before it's required of you. Romans 12, 3 reminds us to be honest in our estimate of ourselves and how we measure our value. And so the first thing I want to talk about this morning is I must be honest about my faith and who I worship. Because you are what you worship. In Mesopotamian culture, Isaiah speaks about it in his book, lovingly titled Isaiah. And he, he writes about the Mesopotamian culture. What they would do is they would take a piece of wood and they would carve eyes and a mouth in it and they would sit it up in a sanctuary back when they were idol worshiping and they would sit there and they would en- enter into a trance-like state and they would look at the piece of wood in the trance-like state. And then when they came out of the trance-like state, they would say the eyes opened and the mouth moved. Have you ever, have you ever thought that someone else, that, that have you, okay, <laughs> Have you ever been, been, have you ever seen someone, I know this sounds crazy, but have you ever seen some, like you've gone to a funeral and you've seen someone who's passed away in the casket? Anybody ever done that? Have you ever tripped out that you think they're breathing? Have you ever done that? Okay, growing up as a kid, my dad was a mortician. You're, you're like, Shar, where's this coming from? Growing up as a kid, my dad was a mortician and uh, we lived upstairs of the funeral home. And so I, it's a crazy childhood, but I was around dead people a lot. Like, I literally, I see dead people. Yes, I did, all the time. And so I remember this one time, my dad and mom, I was really little, and they walked out of the room, and I, it was just me and the dead person. And all of a sudden, I was like, they're breathing. <gasps> they're breathing. They're breathing. Because I was never afraid of dead people. I was afraid they'd come back to life, Right? And then I remember learning about divine healing, and then I went home to try to, you know, when Jesus raised the dead, and I remember, like, I, I like, could literally go home and try it. And I was like, <laughs> right? Like, could you imagine if someone would have sat up? I would have been like, I would have freaked out. Anyways. But I ran to my dad. I was a little girl. I ran to my dad, and I go, Daddy, Daddy, that guy's breathing. He goes, no, honey, he's not. And I go, no, Daddy, he's breathing. He goes, no, no, Daddy has ensured that he's not breathing. And I go, but Daddy, he's breathing. He goes, honey. He goes, you're breathing, you're going up and down. And so because you're going up and down, as you're looking at him, you think he's going up and down too, his chest. I go, oh, really? So he's not breathing? Yeah, no, he's good. All right. They would enter into this trance-like state. They would look at the piece of wood. They would look at it for so long that the eyes begin to move and the mouth begin to move. And then they would enter out of the trance-like state in this Mesopotamian culture, and they would say, the eyes opened and the mouth moved. And Isaiah said, no, 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 no. The transformation didn't happen in the piece of wood. The piece of wood didn't become more like you. You became more like the piece of wood. Psalm 115.8 says this in regards to idol worshipers, that those who make them will be like them. You can see what you worship by looking at what you're becoming. So I have to ask myself, am I becoming more like Christ? Or am I becoming more like another human being or another thing that I'm worshiping? So you say, how do you do that, Char? You can take a spiritual inventory. I used to have a book in my library called 10 Questions to Diagnose Your Spiritual Health. I used to pull it out every year. I hated this book. Didn't want to do it, but I did. One of the first questions he asks to diagnose your spiritual health, where you're at, sometimes it's just nice. You know, we go in every year. Well, if you get older, you go in every year, you get a physical, you get a little checkup. But do we do that in regards to our spirituality? Donald Whitney says this. This is how you can diagnose your spiritual health. Do you thirst for God? Number two, are you governed increasingly by God's word? Are you more loving? Maybe this is something you can take an annual inventory. Number four, are you more sensitive to God's presence? Five, do you have a growing concern for the spiritual and physical needs of others? Six, do you delight in the bride of Christ, or do you like those you go to church with, those who you're in fellowship with, those who you're in connection with in the body of Christ? Number seven, are the spiritual disciplines increasingly important to you? Number eight, do you still grieve over sin? Number nine, are you quick to forgive? And number ten, do you long for heaven and to be with Jesus? I find the older you get, the more you long for heaven. When you're really young, you really don't think about it much, and then as you get older, and you start accumulating people up there, heaven starts to have a face, right? And then you realize you have a welcoming committee up there. 
So do I need to Tom? Do I need to tell on myself about where I'm at in my faith? That's just a question I'm throwing out there for us today. You say, Char, we're in Bible school. We're at a, we're at a theological seminary. What do you mean? I need to be honest about where I'm with my faith. Absolutely. If you could take this list from last year and compare it from where you are last year to this year, have you grown? That's just a question. The second thing is I must be honest about my fears. I'm telling you, these are the things that if in life, that if I'm not honest about where I'm at in my faith and where I'm at in my fears, can determine where my leadership ends up. Fears have always been a really big thing in my life. For some people, they're like, yeah, I'm not afraid of much. Man, I, was, I, was, I just felt like I was born afraid of everything. I've always said that the women in my family passed on a few things, and one of them was faith, which I'm so uh, excited about. I, I love that I have the faith of the generations. My grandfather was a minister. My father's a minister. It's just a wonderful heritage that I have. But they, they passed on faith, fears, and food. I'm telling you, I'm telling you that right now. My nana was afraid of everything. I remember she used to tell us, "You kids, be careful. You could drown in a glass of water." And I'm like, "What?" It didn't help growing up with daddy as a mortician. It was always kind of like a thousand ways not to die. You know, he'd be like, "When it says on a ladder, this is not a step. You should really pay attention to that." You see this guy over here, right? <laughs> it's the truth. Fears. I had a lot of fears. For I, the Lord, Isaiah 41, 13 says, For I, the Lord, your God, hold your right hand. It's I who say to you, do not fear. I will help you. Years ago, I was living out in a little cottage in Roseville. And um, I had a dog at the time. I always have a dog. But I had a dog at the time. And she hated to come inside. And so it was a really, it was a stormy night. And she didn't want to come in. So she was... She, she loved to lay out in the rain. She was just, she had a real thick coat. She was a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. She loved the water. She hated being inside, and so I just thought, well, I couldn't, I, I used to try to get her in the house with all sorts of treats, and I'd be like, salami, you know, I would like, look, salami, fresh salami, you know, all these things, and she wouldn't come in, and so I just thought, well, if you're happy out there, have fun in the storm. I hope nobody calls, like, the animal control on me, because this is bad parenting, but... So I'm sitting there, and uh, it's like 8 o'clock at night, and then all of a sudden the lights go out. And, you know, the first thing you think is, I don't know, like when you're single female and you're living by yourself and the lights go out, my first thought is, he cut the lines. Now, I don't even know who he is, (laughs) right? Like, who is he, right? But I just know he's out killing, whoever he is, he's out killing somebody, and he's after me. That's that's all I know, right, in the back of my mind, because I've watched a lot of movies. And so... uh, then all of a sudden I go, well, it's probably the storm, you know, because it was really windy outside. Oh, sure, it's the storm. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And so, you know, it's 8 o'clock at night, and you're like, okay, well, there's no lights on. I guess I'll, um, whew, I'm feeling kind of tired. I guess I'll go to bed. So I'm going to turn in early. So I head off to bed, and then all of a sudden about 2 o'clock in the morning, I wake up to this crazy, like we all, if we have a dog, we all know our dogs bark, right? Like, ruff, ruff, the mailman. Ruff, 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 your mother. Right. And then like, a killer. Right. And then so it's two in the morning and I wake up to the killer bark. No lie. Like my dog is flipping out. And when I look, when I open my eyes through my bedroom window, I see a flashlight. Okay, wait, what? Now, I'm laying there, and this has always been my biggest fear. This is my nightmare. And I've always thought, what do I do if someone breaks into my house? And I always had told myself, I'll just play dead. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll just play dead. Like, like he'll be like, oh, I'm going to kill this one. Oh, nope, she's already dead. I guess I'm on to the next house. Right? That was just my goal. Just play dead. Right? And so I go, no, Char, you can't play dead. This is your moment. So I'm like getting myself all pumped up. You can do this. You can put your right arm outside the covers. Because, you know, remember as a kid, like if anything was out, like under the covers was safe, but anything outside the covers was legit. It was like he could get that. It was a target. So I'm like, you can put your right arm outside of the covers. And so now I have like the Rocky theme song. You guys know the movie Rocky? Okay. It's like, it's like going, it's da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da, 
my right arm's out, da 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 da, because my phone's across the room and I've got to go get the phone so I can dial 911. Da 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 da, da 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 da, right legs out. I'm like, you could, you could do this. You're made for this moment, Char. You got this. You got this. So I. I go across the room and I pick up the phone and I dial 911 and she goes, Placer County Sheriff. I, Shh, okay. Why is she talking? So, you're gonna, you're telling the guy out he can already hear you. She's talking so loud. I'm like, um, yeah, um, I, I think there's a man trying to break into my house. And she says these words to me. She goes, well, can you go to the front of the house and look out and see if there's anything in the driveway? I'm like, what? No, no, this is why I'm calling you. Because you're the one who's, you know, I don't want to be my own popo. Like, I pay taxes so that you will come to my house and do this for me, okay? She goes, well, just go and look. Just go and see if there's anybody, if there's a truck out there or anything. And I go, okay, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. And so I do like the army crawl. Now, I lived in a, in a cabin, a little cottage that was so small that, like, you could fry eggs and take a shower at the same time. No lie. It was, like, so, so tiny. So I'm really kind of exaggerating, but... And I, I do this army crawl across the house, and then, and, then, and then I look out the blinds. But I don't look out eye level, right? You never do that. Why? Because he could be looking right at you. So I, I get down real low, and I'm looking out like this. And she goes, do you see anything? And I go, oh, he brought a truck. And so immediately in my mind's eye, he has me rolled up in my carpet, right? And I'm like, he's killed me. He's rolled me up in my carpet. And I'm like, why did I buy that carpet? I shouldn't have ever bought that carpet, right? And then he's like dumping my body in the river. I'm like, I will never see my mother again, right? All of these things are in my mind. And all of a sudden she goes, do you see anything? I go, yes, he brought a truck. And she goes, well, what does it say? And I go, it says P, G, and E. Oh. <sighs> All right, and it's so funny in that moment how you go in a, in a second from having lost your mind to sanity. I go, all right, well, you have a great night. Thanks so much for your help. You've been so helpful. She's like, okay, all right, thank you. And I go, okay, all righty, good night, bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you for the police out there. So I went and went to sleep. You're like, Char, why did you tell us that story? Because this, when I'm honest about my fears, and I'm able to tell on myself in regards to the crazy fears that are in my head, and I'm able to go to a good Christian brother or sister and able to say, hey, this is what I'm being plagued with right now because I don't know about you, but fear is torment. Fear is torment. And when I'm able to do that, they are able to remind me, it's okay, Char, it's just the PG&E truck. Do you know that 80% of the things that we are afraid of never actually even come true? And so there's, I have spent so much time in the wreckage of my future looking at things and worrying about things that have never happened. So do, I'm going to ask us today, do I need to tell on myself about my fears and the level that they're holding me back? Maybe in this room, it's not a fear of your future, but maybe it's a fear of just even signing up for an extra class. It may be a small fear, but that fear is just holding you back. And the last thing I want to talk about, am I honest about my flaws? Am I honest about my flaws? Am I okay on time? How much do I have left? About 15 minutes. Oh, I'm good. All right, so open your Bibles. No, I'm just easy. Years ago when I was in Bible school, I've been in lots of Bible schools. My mom calls me a professional student. My mom also calls me boo-boo. I don't know if that's a term of endearment or an owie, but I was working. One of my first jobs was at Sears, man. Sears. You guys remember Sears? Yeah. My grandma used to get me clothes there. I worked in Sears. I worked in the vacuum section. It sucked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And uh, we had this manager that was just, she was mean. She was just on this power kick, and she was always walking around. And she, you know, I look back now, and, she, well, she was probably, you know, just doing her job. But she would tell me things like, you know, don't sit on the job. And I was like, whatever. Okay. All right. And so here it was. It was a Friday night, and it was really slow. You know, who, whoever's buying vacuums on a Friday night really doesn't have a life. And so... I was sitting there, and I had just put one of those big peppermints in. You know those after-dinner mints? They used to give them away at restaurants after you have a nice meal. They bring up the check on a little tray, and then they have those little peppermints on there. Well, Daddy never let me have a full one until I was older because he always used to say, that's the same size as your windpipe, and that could get caught. You could choke to death on that mint. 
he'd always bite it in half. So I couldn't wait until I became an adult and I could have a mint all to myself, right? And I always used to think like, why don't they give those mints out that have the holes in the middle? And then I could have a whole one to myself. But I was sitting down on the job and I had the, one of those peppermints and I put it in. I didn't bite it in half. I'm an adult now. I'm not going to choke. And all of a sudden, the manager comes out of the back room, and when she does, I see her, and I, you know what? She's already gotten on to me once for sitting down on the job, and so I pop up, and when I do, I take a deep breath in, and that mint, you know what's coming. It gets caught, like right here. And so I run to the back room, and I thought, well, I'll just wash it down. And so I start grabbing sodas, and I'm trying to wash it down, and it's not going down. Soda's actually now making its way through my nasal cavity. And if you've ever had soda come out your nose, it burns so bad. And now my eyes are watering, and I am an absolute mess. I'm having a hard time breathing. I sound like this. <gasps> right? And so I walk out into the middle of the uh, freezer section. I'll never forget it. I'm at Sears and I'm in the middle of the freezer section and I'm standing there and I don't want to have to ask for help because I can't believe I'm so mad at myself that I'm choking. And I'm standing there and, I, uh, and this lady walks by and she goes, are you choking? And I go, uh. <laughs> and she goes, do you need the Heimlich? Okay, these are things you never want to hear, right? Do you need the Heimlich? And I go, uh. And so she gives me the Heimlich, and it, it doesn't pop out, but it goes, it goes down, and so I'm, uh, I, I'm okay, I'm alive. She's a lifesaver, literally. But the reality is this. Did you know that most people who choke to death do so in the bathroom? Why? Because you're out at a nice, fine establishment eating dinner. Maybe somebody's invited you, you're on a date, and they're like, I'm going to take you to Ruth's Chris tonight. And you're like, oh, baller okay? So you're eating your filet, and you're cutting it, and you remember daddy saying, now chew that good, don't choke. And all of a sudden, though, it gets stuck right here. Well, you know what? It is so unattractive to choke to death. Am I right? Like, when you're, when you're choking, you're like, you got snot coming out. You, you're, you're crying. You're trying to play it off like you're okay, right? And what do people usually say? Oh, it's just wrong pipe right? Don't we always say that? We, we, take, we take a drink of something and it goes, you're like, oh, it just went down the wrong way. I'm okay, really. <laughs> and so what usually what people do is they get up and they wander over to the restroom by themselves. And that's where they find them. The reality is this, is we hate to have to ask for help. And it's a flaw. I have to be honest about my flaws. I have to tell on myself about my flaws. I hate having to ask for help. I will be at Walmart. I will go over to the spatula section. In the, I will go over to the kitchen section, grab a spatula, go back over to the canned food aisle, climb up on the shelf, bring the canned food that I'm getting over to me. Somebody will walk up with a blue vest and be like, can I help you? And I'm like, you don't see I got it. You don't, you don't see I have? Last night, literally, I'm at Home Depot. I don't want to have to look for somebody. I scamper up on the scaffolding. I... I try it out to see if it's going to hold me, and I go up, and I'm grabbing shelving on top of shelving. This was, like, really dangerous, and I'm like, if somebody sees me right now, they're going to be like, excuse me, ma'am, you need to get down from there. But I'm, like, looking around. I'm sneaking. Why? Because I hate to have to ask for help. I'm going to share with you some of my other struggles. I also struggle with perfectionism and procrastination. I want it done perfectly, but I'll do it tomorrow. My mom bought me a book one time on procrastination. I've only read half of it because I'm going to read the rest later. I can be the laziest person I know. So I make myself get up and go to the gym. I make myself get up at 4 in the morning. I do my devotion so that I can win the morning. I don't want to experience pain or do anything that is uncomfortable. These are my flaws. I crave comfort on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. I like to be comfortable. The other day, my sister, we're standing there, and I just, uh, there's a counter sitting there, and I just plop down, and I sit there. She goes, you okay? And I go, yeah, why? She goes, well, and I go, I just wanted to sit down. I was just tired of standing. I don't want to put on the armor of God. Why? Because armor is uncomfortable. Think about that. The Lord says put on the armor of God, but seriously, who wants to walk around in a helmet all day, Right? That's uncomfortable. Armor makes you uncomfortable. I'm extremely impatient. I hate to have to wait for anything, and so waiting on God doesn't come naturally, so I beat my body while God changes my heart. Whoo! I'm preaching way better than you guys are letting on. 
All of my outward flaws are manageable through works, but only God can change my heart. Only God can change my heart. And so he's giving me the desire and the, des- and the will to do what pleases him. For a good confession, there needs to be three things that are necessary. An examination of the con- conscience, sorrow, and a determination to avoid sin. But I've also realized that my weaknesses or my flaws are what make me human. And they're relatable. See, there's something that I hate even more than my weaknesses. It's unrelatable holiness. Have you, ever met, have you ever met that individual who's unrelatable because they are so holy? They don't seem to have any struggles at all. You don't want to be friends with that person. Why? Because they're not real. Unrelatable holiness. People who lack self-awareness and how their level of holiness comes across as pride. They're unrelatable. Nobody wants to follow unattainable and unrelatable holiness. So I'll never forget one of the greatest things that I, I remember, one of the greatest lessons that Oprah taught me in my generation. Everybody rushed home to watch her at 4 o'clock. But I'll never forget she had, she had a lady on who had been trapped in her house by a serial killer. Now, remember I tell you that that was always my worst fear. He had already killed two other women, and he had trapped her, and he was getting ready to kill her. And Oprah said, what was it that made you come out alive? Why did he save you and kill the other women? And she said this, I begin to relate to him. I told him about the time I'd been in prison, too. I told him about the drugs that I'd done. And he let me make him breakfast before I left to go get my daughter. I was like, man, I don't know what I would do if I was in that situation. I'd be back in the bathroom, man, trying to draw tattoos. Like, yeah, I got this st- when I was down in Chowchilla. I, you know, like. But here's the reality, that our stories are all unique, and our weaknesses are all unique. And the amount of power and strength that God gives us is unique because then we become uniquely useful for the kingdom of God. I may never be able to tell you how to overcome drug addiction, but I do know what has worked for food addiction. I do know what it was like to lose 115 pounds and be able to keep it off for eight years. I do know that. I do know a little bit about being able to beat your body and put it into in the disciplines that I've been able, that God has enabled me to instill in my life so that I can be uniquely useful. And so the question I ask today is, do I need to Tom, do I need to tell on myself in regards to a flaw that's holding me back from all that God has for me? See, honest confession has been a powerful tool in my life because it's allowed me to avoid isolation. It's forced me to ask for help, and it's helped me to stay loyal and devoted to following Christ and the calling he's placed on my life. James says it this way, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can be healed because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I'm reminded of this. To be healed is to become sound again. When I tom, when I tell on myself through honest confession, I return to a state of soundness. Hmm. I'm no longer saying one thing while doing another. I'm no longer double-minded. I'm whole. I'm I'm sound. I'm healed. Would you just close your eyes with me? Wherever you're at, I've looked at some areas in my life that have been useful, that I've been able to say, hey, these are some of my struggles, areas in regards to my my faith, areas where I need to grow. And one of the greatest people in my life that I have to be honest with is myself. And so after we get done, after we conclude with this devotion today, I'm going to ask you to take some time to sit. Maybe you pull out a journal and you say, you know what? I need to be honest with myself of where I'm at in regards to my faith. Am I growing in my faith? Yeah, I'm enrolled in a class. I'm doing all these things. But am I really growing in my faith? If I could take that diagnostic test, what does it say? Am I more loving? Am I growing in my faith? 
The other area of honesty is what are the level of fears that are holding me back? I recently heard Ed Milet say, he said this, he said, don't do what you love, do what you fear. And that challenged me. Because in the area of leadership right now in my life, I'm having to step out into so many different levels of leadership, but it's levels where I've been afraid before. And God is calling us past our fears. And then the last thing is, are you honest about your flaws? Because when I'm honest about my flaws, then I'm aware that I don't have to repeat them. And God can lead me in freedom. So let me pray over you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my some family, God. I pray, Jesus, that as we finish up this semester, Lord, that we would be challenged to walk in the discipline of confession. Because, God, it's good for the soul. Let us, Father, confess even first to ourselves. Lord, let us confess to you. And then let us find a safe brother or sister who knows how to hold confidence that we is trustworthy, that we can also walk alongside and we can confess to as well, God. It's been a powerful discipline in my life, Jesus. Thank you for this tool. Thank you for your word, God, that you truly do give us the desire and the power to do what pleases you. God, thank you for my son family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability. It is important to be able to see people further along in the process who aren't afraid to talk about their own flaws and what that's looked like to be able to work it out because then you don't learn what it looks like in your own life. So thank you for going first so that we can then follow. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please join us again tomorrow for our last service for our Spiritual Emphasis Week. Uh, Pastor Jesse Galinda will be here at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time or Pacific Pacific. <laughs> I keep messing these up. Pacific Daylight Time, uh, whichever one it actually we are actually in right now. Uh, we will see you again tomorrow. Um, I'm going to pray this out one more time uh, and just thank God for today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity. God, I pray that you would bless Char uh, for, for being vulnerable and for going first. God, we thank you for her heart. We thank you for all that you have um, coming up in the next couple of months for her. Um, God, I pray that you would give her wisdom. And as she continues to be a part of the disciplines that she does, uh, God, I pray that you would continue to use her in mighty ways and that her, her, her tent would increase uh, because she is submitted to you uh, and she is obedient to what you have for her life, God. Father, we thank you for today.